trying to talk about, they're saying, well, we're going to have world peace. We're going to have world peace. Let me tell you, world peace will come, but it will be when Jesus comes and splits the Mount of Olives, sets mm -hmm. his feet down, and he rules and reigns. Then there will be peace on earth. That's, right. That's it. There will never, there will always be wars, rumors of wars. If you read chapter, Matthew chapter 24, there will always be. There always has been, there always will be. But we can find peace in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I'm not telling you that you're not going to go through things in life. And as we look at this 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 wonderful day, now this Matthew chapter, oh, I'm sorry, Mark chapter four is a one day occurrence with this. People will look at this and they will say, "Well, it really doesn't make sense that the Son of God gets tired." Remember. 100% God, 100% man. He got tired, just like we get tired. People today are tired of looking for a place they can find peace and contentment. 
and something that they can hang on to. They're tired. But I can promise you, Jesus will give you and I, them, a peace that's everlasting. Starting in verse 30, 35. And, and the word peace, I've got, I've got to go with this so you'll, so you'll follow me in. The word peace, uh, freedom from disturbance, tranquility, man, tranquility. Look that word up. I ain't got time to go into that. A state or period in which there is no war or war has ended. See, there's a war that's going on. Man, it just... Brother Buddy and I talk sometimes during the week. I ask questions because he's a mentor of mine. But I, I don't think I've ever told him what I'm preaching on. And the song that he sang, man, just God. Okay, just God. But there's war that is going on, not just external war, but internal war. That's right. And there's a battle that's raging. Stop looking for peace in the wrong place. Stop looking for peace in things that you can buy. Stop looking for peace in things that think you, they're going to make you happy. What makes you happy in, is in Christ. What gives you contentment is in Christ. What gives you peace is knowing that he is in control of it all. Not us, not the government, no king, no president, no matter what they may think, no matter who they may be, they're not in control. He is. And I'll stand on that until I point my feet straight up in the grave. Or unless we're raptured home, whichever comes first. Right. So Jesus has been teaching all around. And I, 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 when I was reading and studying this, I, I got to thinking about some things. And I, I came up with, with, with one thing that I, I had to just, and I'm not aggravating Kathy and Nail, please don't think I am. But y'all remember the Sunday that I told you four times that Jesus crossed the Mediterranean Sea. Well, I had to go do a little digging, Kathy and Nail, and come to find out where the Mediterranean Sea is and the Sea of Galilee this way. Is about 34 miles. So, if I say Mediterranean again, just wave your hand. <laughs> I mean, just, just praise the Lord. That, that's it. That's it. <laughs> but they're all around, and Jesus has been, he's spent. That's, that's a better word for that. He's, he's, he's really just give out. So, verse 31, right quick. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, now, if you hadn't got this line underlined, or verse underlined, this part, let us go over to the other side. Now, that means the other side of the lake. Lake Gennesaret, not the Mediterranean, <laughs> but the Sea of Galilee. Now, to give you a little backstory, and we've talked about the Sea of Galilee once or twice before, maybe, but just to give you a little bit about it, the way this sea is formed, or, or, or laid out, it's actually 630 feet below sea level. It's the next to the last sea lake in that class. The Dead Sea is the lowest at 600, and I think it's 85 feet below sea level. Nothing can live in the Dead Sea. It's so full of salt that you can actually lay in and just float. You can't sink. Now, Carolyn will tell you she has problems going to the bottom with, with the way her, her anatomy is of a pool. Well, I can tell you, every one of us can float in the Dead Sea. Now, the Sea of Galilee is this big place. Of course, it has a lot of fishing. And I mean, there's several, several things that went on in all of these areas. But it's 13 miles wide, <coughs> wide excuse me, and about eight, seven and a half, eight miles across. Somewhere in this picture, Jesus is telling his disciples, look, I'm tired. I need to rest. 
I've been preaching all day, and I'm, I, I can tell you, you can ask Brother Buddy, when we fill a pulpit, at the end of that evening, especially if you have Sunday morning, Sunday night, that afternoon, you're spent. I am. I mean, you're, you're tired. And when I say weary, I don't mean in a, in, a, in a bad way. I mean in a physical state, you're just drained. So Jesus has been doing this all day. And he tells his disciples, let's go to the other side. So they head out. Now, verse 36, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. Now this is really intriguing to me. Where they were going was probably, and I'll probably mispronounce this word, but probably over to the Cardanians, not the Kardashians, please don't think that, the Cardanians, <laughs> to rest. Uh, Jesus did get tired. I'll, I'll give you these verses. I'm not going to go through them. Mark 6, 31. He also was talking about how tired he was at the woman at the well, at Jacob's well. At John 4, 6, he also sympathizes with us in Hebrews 4, 15, and 16 about him being made in like form so he knows what we're struggling with. He knows what we're going through, not just spiritually, but physically. <clears throat> so, when it says they took him as he was, that really got intriguing to me. And I thought, well, they took him as the master. They took him as someone that had done miracles. They took him, they, they had seen, you know, the, the leper heal. They had seen, you know, several different things go on. But it goes farther than that. It means very possibly he was so tired and weary from all day preaching the gospel that the disciples actually had to physically pick him up Put him onto the boat and into the stern of the ship. That's how tired he was. Now I can see that. Of course, Jesus could have done anything that he wanted to. He could have, you know, had angels minister to him, like happened in the garden or in the day of temptation. That could have happened, but he didn't. And I really believe that. Uh, and I think that was Alexander McLaren that, that said that. And I think, wow, carrying the master into the ship for rest. Now there's another picture that goes with this. Those of us that are workaholics, we need rest. We need to rest our physical body from a long day to recoup, to regenerate our body, to build it back up I think there's something in the book of Genesis. Somewhere, something like, and in six days God created all, but on the seventh he rested. Wow. So, as they shove off, and these are no just not very small boats, they're, they're mid sized boats, just big enough to have. Kind of a, a compartment underneath the end of the stern of the ship. So they start out. And uh, again, the way this lake is, is, is laid out, there are certain ways these storms come upon. And I, I love this picture because there's certain ways that storms come upon us unannounced. And then we are like the disciples. And I, and I don't want to take anything away from the disciples. But the rest of that verse. They took him as he was. And other little boats were also with him. Very possibly some of the people that were following him. Some travelers. Could have been fishermen going at night. Because that's when they fished. Because the waters were cooler. More than likely. But as they headed out. Verse 37. And a great wind. Wow. 
had to look at this wind. On this lake, the way it's shaped, it has mountain regions around it. And I think I've told you this before. And if I have, just excuse me and, and, and listen. But the way it is, the coolness is here and the warm air comes over and the clouds form and, and, and go down. That can pop up a severe storm within minutes. Some describe this like a small hurricane. The, the word for this is L-A-E, L-A-P-S, layups. A wind that is suddenly whirled around upwards and downwards. A storm tempest, almost a hurricane force winds. Now, I had to go back and look. Now, you know, Katrina was a Category 5. That's the worst. A Category 1, Category 1 hurricane, the winds are from 74 miles per hour to 95 miles per hour. But can you imagine the winds, remember from a hurricane, or a straight line wind coming straight in? These winds don't do that. They go up and then they come down. It, it, it's almost a downdraft or it's almost a microburst, but a microburst comes from here down but doesn't go back up. So they're getting hammered from both waves, waves and wind. Now fear sets in. Just like it will do to us sometimes. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. Know that song? When I'm growing old and weary, stand by me. Wow. So the disciples are fighting, I really believe, with everything they are. And remember, these are fishermen, these are seasoned men. They've seen these storms before. But this was such a storm that they didn't know what else to do. They were fighting one way to try to go across. And it's kind of those, uh, the way you take two, step, uh, two steps forward and three steps back. My thinking, just my thinking, I really think they got pretty close to the middle. Kind of where we get sometimes when we're going through a storm of life. We'll get to the middle and we'll just, I'm done. I can't do it on my own. I'm through, God. You've led me this far. Now, what are you going to do? Hmm. Go back to the first one we read. Verse 35, the second part of that. Now, you got the reason I said underline this, I want you to look. Let who? Let. Us. Let us go to the other side. See, he didn't tell the disciples, I want you to go to the other side. See, we forget sometimes that when we go through things, he's right there with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He never throws us out to the wolves. And the disciples are, they're panicking. But that's all of us. So the disciples were, were learning as they were going, just like we do as Christians. We learn sometimes, and I hate to say it, from, from the world of hard knocks. We kind of put our faith to the side and we look at what the world's going to give us. Now, mind you, it's okay to look at what's coming worldly-wise. But remember, the one that owns the cattle on a thousand hills also owns the hills that the cattle are on. Mm -hmm. So he knows what we're going through. Jesus was tired. He wanted rest. Wow. Wow. Verse 37, and a great wind storm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was almost ready, already filling. <coughs> These boats that they had, I had to go back and do a little research on some of these. And by the way, 
Um, 2018, maybe, I think I have my date right, I may be wrong. But the Sea of Galilee was, that area was kind of in a drought. And they uncovered one of the older boats that were in the, in the bottom of the, the, the silt and the sand in the bottom of there. It's on display now. Of course, a lot of people say, you know, that was Peter's boat. It, I, I don't say it's Peter's boat. I don't know whose it was. It was a fishing boat. But these things were made really, really tough. But when the wind starts blowing and the rain starts coming, remember, they're fighting winds up and down. They're fighting rain that's blowing across. You know, these storms we had a couple of weeks ago that came through and you had straight line winds at 70 to 80 miles per hour and you see the rain going this way, not this way. That's the way we get sometimes with our life. It starts raining and then it blows sideways with us. And we're holding on for everything we're worth tossed from side to side. And then they have this idea. I don't know who said it, but it should have been the first thing that they thought about. But he was in the stern, verse 38, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? There's a lot of people today. There's, there's millions of people today that think that God doesn't care. That's what we are, we are for. We have got to tell them God cares about you. He loves you. He knows what you're going through. Well, God can't do anything about it because he's not here. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. First thing that you have to understand, mm -hmm. when you're walking with him, I didn't say it was going to be easy. It's going to be easier. I think it was Brother Lloyd that brought up in Bible study that, you know, every day that he walks with the Lord, is more precious than the day before. But the people that are out there not knowing how to walk with the Lord, how to trust him in the storm. I used to be one of those. The first little, little bitty thing that came along, it just, I would automatically think, oh, what are we going to do? How am I going to take care of this? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? When am I going to do this? How about let God show us how he's going to carry us through the storm and lead us to the other side. And when we get to the other side, we're going to look back and we're going to think, wow, he got me all the way through that. But people don't want to big, do the small things, brother buddy. They want to do the big things. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the small. Maybe there's something in your life today that you're struggling with. You don't have peace about it. You know, looking at those people that we were able to feed last Sunday. You know, there was not a worry on their face that they didn't have, but they didn't show it. They were grateful for the food that we brought. They said, thank you. But they were still missing something. They were missing that wonderful relationship that we can have, anyone can have, that wants to know Christ Jesus. As they go awake, the master is, he calls him. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Flip over with me, and I've got three scriptures with this verse that I really want to go to. 
Psalms 139. If you will flip over with me there just a moment. And some of you will know this by heart. Verses 1 through 4. Oh Lord, this is what are David writings. Oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue but behold, O oh Lord, you know all together. Verse 5. You have hinged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Wow. God, you know everything about me. Everything. You know where, you know where my fears are. The bad thing about it, you know what? I really believe Satan knows where our fears are also. And when he brings those in, are we going to let him try to do damage to us? Are we going to claim the name of Jesus that's going to walk us through that trouble? See, the world's looking at us as Christians. And if we fall to the world's side, you know, that scripture that says, we can't worry about today or tomorrow, or tomorrow will take care of itself. Jesus said, how many of us worrying about anything will add any, any days to us, or any hours to us, basically? You know, that kills a lot of people is worry. My mother, when we would have our talks, at least once a day, I'm worried about so-and-so. I'm worried about so-and-so. And it's hard to tell your mother, mother, you're going about this the wrong way. But I finally prayed up enough and got enough courage to do it gingerly. I said, mother, why do you worry? It's just because this, it's because this, it's because this. I said, do me a favor. I said, let God have the worry and you be concerned. And she looks at me like one of those looks like well, all of you have had the looks of your mother before, right? <laughs> and mother at 78 or 70, she was 79 when she passed away, 78 or so we were talking about this, and we were sitting at the kitchen table, and she had turned kind of to the side like this, and when I said that, she goes, I mean, it was that ninja move. And I thought, oh, my word. I have said something so disrespectful to my mother. And before I apologized, which I was fixing to, she said, I need to do that. Thank you, Lord, that I didn't get knocked out of the chair. <laughs> and I thought about it after I said that. It's okay to be concerned. Yes, I know that worry is going to creep in sometimes. But he knows who we are. He knows our sitting down. He knows our rising up. Flip over with me to Deuteronomy 31. Now, this passage is used many times in Scripture. Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. Starting in verse 7. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of Israel, Be strong and good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn their fathers to give them. And you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord said, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. 
He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Powerful words. Don't worry about it. The storms are going to come. The way we're going to get through them is let Jesus walk through us with us. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. He's not going to leave us alone. There are some out there that will tempt God. Well, if God is the God who he says he is, I can do this, 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 and this. Sometimes I really want to call those uh, thrill seekers or you know, thrill junkies or all these kind of stuff. God also gives you common sense not to do crazy things. First Peter 5, 7. This is actually what I spoke on. I told y'all uh, Wednesday night that I had 15 minutes to speak. And I got through in 12. <laughs> 1 Peter <clears throat> chapter 5. Verse 6 to start with. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time casting the watch says <laughs> verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So Jesus, if you care about us, what are you going to do? We're sinking here. We're fixing to perish. We're fixing to die. Everything that you've done, you've healed people miraculously. We've seen that. But now you've taken us out in the middle of this storm and you're sitting in the boat asleep on a pillow. And when it says pillow, it doesn't mean a nice fluffy cotton pillow or down pillow. It means probably a small wooden block. So they go down and they get him and say, Master, 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 you've got to come up here. You've got to see this. Jesus, not, uh, you know, and, and I, I know how my brain works, and sometimes it doesn't work like everybody else's, but that's okay. That's what makes us different. But as Jesus is down in the stern, I really think what he probably did, when they go and wake him up, he probably goes and looks at him and he says, okay. And he takes his leisurely time. Kind of like he does with Lazarus. Three days later, he gets there. Jesus is trying to teach them something. He goes up. And I really believe he walks to the front of the ship. Some of your Bibles have different wording. But it says he rebuked the winds and the waves. Now I know we're running a little over schedule. But you'll be all right. I promise you. So I had to look at this. Are you ready for this? The Greek word translated rebuke. In the Greek root word epitimo. Now that's A-E-P-I-T-I-M-A-O. Literally, it means to assign, assign or acknowledge the value of, of something. In this case, Jesus judges that the wind is not wanted there. It's the same word used when Jesus confronts demons. What? He rebuked it. Wait, it gets better. He says, peace be still. Now you see there's an exclamation point there. That's the reason it's there is because of a commanding voice. 
He says, peace, be still. I don't think he pointed, he just said it. Now watch how this goes. Peace is the form of the Greek root word, siopao, that's S-I-O-P-A-O, which literally means to be quiet or to refrain from speaking. Still comes from the Greek root word, phimil, that's P-H-I-M-O-O, which is to keep quiet as with a muzzle, keep under control or silence it. Have we let Jesus silence our storms? When he says to this wind and wave, peace be still. Can you imagine him just standing there and the disciples' eyes are this big and they're seeing everything that's going on? And it doesn't say it took a little bit of time. Immediately it goes, calm. That's what he wants to do with us. The worries, the fears, and everything that Satan brings upon us, he says, peace be still. Know who you're dealing with. Know who's in control. Well, wait a minute. You mean that he controls that too? So he made all these hurricanes for him. I didn't say that. So he, evidently he does. He's controlling of it all. I didn't say that. He allows things to happen. The weather is going to be the weather. Now let me get something straight. And I want you to listen to me. And there's probably going to be some people that are absolutely going to fall over in their chairs when they hear this. All this stuff that's going on as far as weather and things like that. It's not global warming. It's not climate change. God is in control of it all. There's, when, when the scripture says there's not one sparrow that falls that he doesn't know about. That's right. Then I can promise you this. He knows about the weather. Matter of fact, he made that weather. Understand he made the oxygen that we breathe. You ever tried to breathe helium? Yeah, for those of us that's done that. Yeah, you have. Go, I see you, I see you, I do. Uh -huh. All right. Let's finish up. I don't know where that came from. It just came. <laughs> Verse 40 and 41. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Remember that verse that it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Ouch. I just got spanked again. <laughs> and the disciples, remember, they're newly followers of Christ. That's the reason I said we can't be too hard on them. They've got the master of the wind riding in the boat with them, and they still were scared to death. They were still fearful. They had not, didn't have a Peace one about them. He says, why? What's the answer? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another. I love that. <laughs> They're talking to one another on the boat with Jesus there. And they said, what kind of man is this? That even the winds and seas obey. The same one that can calm the storms, the fears, the uncertainties in our life is the same one that was 
asleep and riding on that boat that calmed the storm on the sea. The same man. As we call him the God man. So don't let fear ruin your relationship with Christ. Don't let fear, I say ruin, don't let it hinder your relationship. Don't let it get in wedge. Because when we do that, that drops our faith off. Well, Tommy, you're not being fair. What if I have faith that, that, that God's going to heal somebody? And he doesn't. Remember that scripture says his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways, not our ways. Knowing that he has something better in store. Each of you know this by heart. But I'm going to read one of the last part. Some of this has been read over and over and over at even funerals and wherever else. But the Psalm of David in verse 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now watch verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of of the shadow of death, I will not fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. There's a lot of people that look at that verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even the fear of death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Mm -hmm. See, if you're anchored on the solid rock, in the solid rock, if you're anchored when death comes, there's joy in the morning. Yes. Amen. But if you're not, then the fears are going to overwhelm you in this life. We'll look next week and start of chapter 5. I think that's where the Lord wants me to go. But I still, we're still in the, the power of God. And I think we're going to go through Easter with that, the series. I can imagine the looks upon their face. When they were talking to each other. What kind of man is this? That even the winds and seas obey? Again, the same man that gave his life for each one of us is the same man that can give each one of us peace, and contentment throughout our life. Let's pray. Fathers, we just uncovered a, just a small portion of this story with you and your disciples on, on that Sea of Galilee. Father, sometimes we're on that sea and we're right in the middle of a struggle, or right in the middle of a, a, a concern, or Father, maybe even a worry. But you're going to carry us through, just like you carry the disciples across that lake. There's going to be some bumps in the road. There's going to be some heartaches. There's going to be some times of, of fear and sadness. But you're going to give us courage. And you're going to build our faith. Even the disciples even requested to you, Lord, strengthen our faith. 
our faith in you. Father, we don't know what hope, what, what, what tomorrow may bring, but we do know who holds tomorrow. Father, we pray right now that if there's one here this morning that has something going on in their life, that Lord, you would just calm them as you calm that storm just by telling them in a miraculous way, peace be still. You have so much that you need for us to do for you, for us to be used by you. Be with those right now, Lord, that we may have on our hearts. Be with those that may watch this video. That, Lord, you would give them peace and contentment. And, Father, if they don't know you, that, Father, you would just enter their lives. That the peace would come that passes all understanding. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Page 552.